Hi, it's Ross Pluskin here, and I'm back at the Top Shelf Aquatics Farm. Now, one of the most intriguing, frustrating, and in my opinion, most worthwhile aspects and contributions of the reef aquarium industry at large is the fact that it has brought so many people, confronted them with the reality that microbes run the world. There is not a reefer alive that has not, frankly, come to the realization at some point that there is something happening when it comes to the corals in our tanks, whether or not they thrive and exhibit beautiful, luxurious colors, or whether or not they bleach away and turn into a frustrating algae-filled mess. There is something happening in the, the, the inner layers too small for our naked human eyes to see. And it is this intrigue, this, this effort to both understand and entertain the various microbial assemblages that make our corals thrive, and more importantly, make them beautiful, that has driven so much passion and so much investment in time and money and sweat and tears of the average reef aquarist into taking passion, stock, and knowledge into what microbes are doing inside a coral and what can be done to better entertain and make them happy. You can only get so far into reefing before you are naturally inclined to wonder what is actually going on inside of that coral. And the answer is that the coral itself is a microbiome. A coral has a microbiome. And today we're going to be starting in my opinion, a really, really great series for our Top Shelf YouTube channel, a series called Mastering Microbes, where we're going to be addressing the various roles that microbes play in the context of a reef aquarium and their ability to make different organisms happy and healthy. And to start off this series, we're going to be addressing a very simple, yet all-encompassing, and entirely vexing and confusing question, what is microbiome? The most easiest, straightforward definition I can offer to you when it comes to what is a microbiome is a microbiome is ecology. It's all ecology, people. And you might think ecology in your head and you think a rainforest or even a coral reef with its various different critters, its cleanup crew, its fish, its corals, its algae, etc. Think of all that complexity, all the different roles, all the partnerships, the warfare, the competition, the nourishment, the collective complexity that gives rise to diversity and, and, and higher life to all these different myriads of species, all very different. The same thing occurs not only in any stretch or, or square foot of a wild coral reef or in the coral reef of our tank, but the same level of complexity and, and, and ecological warfare, competition, growth, nourishment, partnerships, betrayals, all occur in every nanometer of, of glass, on, on a kitchen table, in the air that I'm breathing, in every single organism on this planet, be they a tadpole, be they an acropora, a tang, be they a human like Garrett or I. Yes, every single surface, whether or not it is living or not, every substrate and every living creature on the planet is an assemblage of various infinite worlds, microbiomes, worlds that are not occupied and interacted by monkeys, lemurs, elephants, corals, tangs, uh, urchins, but by bacteria, protists, small cyanobacteria, microalgae, these small single-celled organisms that operate with their own ecology, they grow, they compete, they nourish, but at the same time, gravity doesn't affect them the same way because they are so small and because they are single-celled, they operate in ways that are very, very counterintuitive when we consider everything that we understand in the macro world. So, with all that jibber-jabber as our forefront, let's start to discuss microbiome within the specific context of the coral reef aquarium, and we'll be kind of giving three general spheres of context for trying to understand microbiomes as a whole. The first major set of realms 
where microbiomes occur that affect any reef aquarium that should be considered is any surface which is not living. The substrates of the aquarium, the glass, the areas around the power heads, the inner spaces of the pumps, the water itself, yes, even the air surrounding the tank that is interacting with the water surface. These are areas where the specific bacteria and other microbes that may or may not be there are everything for dictating various integral functions of the reef aquarium. If there are specific microbes that are consuming ammonia and other nitrogenous compounds and consuming phosphates, that's a role of biofiltration. These are also the microbial communities that if they grow in excess or grow in an area or in a way that's relatively subtle, greatly sway the aesthetics of a reef aquarium. Whether or not you have a bunch of stuff growing on your glass and all over your rock work versus whether or not you look at it and it looks like just a little bit of growth or almost looks clean altogether. Whether or not these various surfaces are growing and various different microbes are occurring within them also greatly dictates the forage that things such as copepods, tangs, all sorts of herbivores may or may not be interacting with. The microbiome of the water column dictates whether or not triactic clams and, and electric scallops and other filter feeders have the right forage to access as well. So all these different abiotic areas, the inner rock work, all the surfaces of the reef aquarium are all areas that are living and all areas that interact and greatly sway the other microbiomes that occur within the living organisms themselves. The next incredibly crucial sphere of understanding when it comes to microbiomes, specifically in the reef aquarium environment, is the microbiome of what I would consider everything but the coral. The microbiome of the tanks, of the snails, of the urchins, of tiny bristle worms maybe crawling in and out of the pumps and the plumbing. Every single organism, its skin, the inner layers of its gut, the, the areas in between its muscle, the areas on the surfaces of any hairs or, or, or the projections of its fins, every single square inch nanometer of any organism, be them a hermit crab all the way up to a whale is habitat for microbes. The definition of when it comes to any particular organism having their own microbiome is something of controversy, but also something of apparent fact. There are some organisms that recruit and have specific assemblages of microbes that may or may not change throughout the organism's life, and they are associated with success and health. The human microbiome is not assembled of just human cells. For every one human cell, there's a bacteria cell living in each and every one of us. It helps us process our food, it helps us ward off disease, it helps us maintain the status quo. Or the last consideration we should consider is that there's also room for pathogens in this microbiome. Microbial agents that enter the system and rather than encourage and facilitate the growth of the host or the larger microbiome, be it a tang or the like, it destabilizes the system. It propagates at the cost of the overall diversity of the rest of the microbes around it. This is where some other microbes and pathogens that we'll be discussing, such as vibrios and definitely parasitic diseases such as amelodinium, uh, marine velvet, and cryptocarion, marine ick, these are parasites, bacteria, and parasites that infect microbiomes that are otherwise stable and reproduce at the sake of destroying and destabilizing those microbiomes. And then the last thing that should be really considered when it comes to the microbiome of the moving critters, the non-corals, is that each one of these living, each tang, each, each fish in the tank, each, each shrimp, each hermit crab, each one of them is a mayflower of its microbiome. It's constantly not only receiving wild microbes from the wild through its diet and breathing and water and the like, but it's shedding through its feces and through respiring. It's shedding what's in its guts with the outside environment. And not all those cells die. They may also very well play a role, both beneficial or not, to the microbiomes of other inhabitants of the tank namely the, the microbiomes of 
corals. Now, lastly, and by far most importantly, in consideration of the microbiome in the reef aquarium environment, one has to consider potentially the biggest Pandora's box, the biggest confounding question of it all, the microbiome of, of corals, specifically photosynthetic corals, the ones that at large we are trying to grow, the ones at large that look pretty in our tanks, the ones that we consider so precious. When we are trying to address the microbiome of a coral in our context, the context of the reef aquarium industry, where we are pursuing not only understanding of biology, but trying to use that to achieve beauty. This is where our greatest concern is, and this is where it becomes the greatest obstacle to truly understand what is going on. To understand the, the very complex nature of a coral holobion, its microbiome with its various moving parts at multiple different ecological levels is something that's extremely daunting, but is paramount for us as an industry to not only appreciate further and understand the animals that we love and that we're working with, but to provide us with tools to quantify and actually understand how we can replicate one particular color and one particular set of aesthetic performance under certain conditions, and potentially more importantly, provide us tools to be able to prevent the decay and increase the health and potentially remediate and improve the health of colonies of corals that aren't doing so well and to be able to keep ones that are doing well thriving and growing for decades into the future. Something else that should absolutely be considered when it comes to the microbiome is this concept of lineage, especially in an industry such as ours, we are not only buying and trading and growing animals, we are growing in trading works of art. And therefore, with works of art, the question of lineage and being able to quantify lineage is absolutely important. There are new and approaching genetic techniques which allow us to take samples of that tissue, samples of that beauty, and create PCR genetic stamp codes, where it is essentially a barcode of code that even though it might be an entirely jumbled mess that would be very difficult to interpret, but moving forward, there would potentially be ways to have that barcode truly define flame tip microcladis at that given moment in time and be able to allow people to develop a strain and genetic holobine of coral that reflects a particular color under particular conditions and then have a means of actually being able to quantify that. This has been a brief introduction into our upcoming Mastering Microbe series. We are going to be discussing all kinds of things in this series when it comes to specific ecological roles that any particular bacteria might be playing, like let's say consuming ammonia in a biofilter, uh, onwards to known symbiotic, symbiotic relationships that are very important such as that of the Euplopiscium in the digestive tract of tangs. We'll be discussing all these things, including the pathogens of corals and fish, and we look very much uh, forward to uh, sharing it all with you and having a discussion about this very, very complex, and very confounding uh, uh, set of uh, discoveries when it comes to microbes, how they live, how they thrive, and how they affect everything around us, including every single aspect of our coral reef tanks. So like, subscribe, and please fuel our efforts to start and ignite a greater conversation when it comes to microbiome in the reef aquarium. Thank you, we'll see you next time.